We're excited to announce that our very own podcasting platform, Zencaster, has become a new sponsor to the show. Check out the podcast discount link in our show notes and stay tuned for why we love using Zen for the podcast. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. You're listening to the Rock Art Podcast with Dr. Alan Garfinkel, a podcast about all things rock art. Send us your suggestions. Hello and welcome to the Rock Art Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Webster, with my co-host, Dr. Alan Garfinkel. On today's episode, we continue the story of Dr. Alan Garfinkel and talk about his career in archaeology and what he's doing now. All right. Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. Alan, how are you doing? Good. How are you doing, Chris? This is uh, Rock Art number two, isn't it? <laughs> Rock art number two. We are rocking and rolling here, uh, so to speak. And, you know, I like to, in my other podcasts, I've been mentioning the date that we're recording just so people understand where we are in this crazy quarantine coronavirus world because it's going to be a part of our lives for a long time and things are changing so quickly. I, I just want people to know what our frame of mind is when we're recording. So we're actually recording this on May 19th, 2020. And we are in the midst of, of everybody kind of going back to work and, and doing different things. So... Yeah. How you, how you doing with all that? <laughs> well, I've been sheltered in place, as we call it, for about eight or nine weeks. I haven't really gone mm -hmm. out a lot at all. I've taken walks around the corner, but I found it's been a very productive time. I have so much work to do and so much research and so much other activities that uh, I have an infinite platter of uh, wonderful, a cornucopia of earthly delights. How's that? <laughs> and so, Wait, you, uh, you mean to tell me? You mean to tell me you've gone two months without going to Denny's? <laughs> I, that is the number one thing I miss. If there's anything in, in my life, the, the, my, my top priority is to go to Denny's. As soon as it becomes open, I want to be one of the first visitors for the uh, chicken fried steak breakfast with a couple of uh, over easy eggs. Oh, I, I'll be in seventh heaven. <laughs> what are they delivering? Maybe you can get it delivered. <laughs> That's what I was thinking next. I may have to may have to ask for delivery if it, if this goes on much longer. Uh, yeah. Nice. Nice. I mean so, well, some people some people care about going to the gym, but <laughs> uh, but I care about getting my Denny's breakfast. That's right. That's right. It's all the important things. So, you gotta, well, let's you talk gotta, about you gotta, the You got to have your priorities. It's not a need. <laughs> it's not a need, it's a want. <laughs> That's right. That's right. All right. Well, re regarding the opening of things, we'll talk about upcoming possible summer activities here uh, in a little bit, probably near the end of the show. But let's kind of pick up where we left off because we're still we're still getting to know you a little bit for this podcast. And there's so much there's so much to know. You could be the entire show, Alan. You know that, right? So um, Boy. Uh, I'll tell you what, the, the, you know? the doctor, the doctor G squared, the Alan Garfinkel show. Can you imagine? <laughs> These, uh, nice. You know, I, yeah. I don't even know if that would be possible. <laughs> so anyways, I think it would be. Yeah, but I think it would be. Yes. 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 My, so let's pick this I, up. I used I used to have Friday night uh, dinners, and uh, mm -hmm. I used to you know collaborate with a variety of people over dinner every Friday night, and I would share the experiences of the week. And there was a medical doctor there. Her name was uh, Donna Kono. Mm -hmm. And she said, Alan, you could write a book. It would be a bestseller, but it would have to be fiction because no one would believe the things you've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> no one would believe your life story. It's, it's too crazy. So anyways. That might be true. Yeah, that might be yes. true. Yeah. Yes. Well, speaking of your life story, let's pick up because we didn't really, we started talking about, we, we kind of glossed over some high level stuff on the end of the last episode. And um, ideally, as we release this podcast to people who are listening to it in real time, they're hearing both of these episodes. So if you haven't listened to episode one yet, because your podcast player downloaded episode two, Go back, listen to episode one, uh, download it. If you're using a podcast player, you might have to tell it to go download that first episode because a lot of times it's just the most current one if you just found the show. So go listen to that and then we'll pick up with back at your PhD research with this episode because I think we just kind of glossed over that. So to reiterate from the first episode... 
what did you study for your PhD at, uh, and that was at Davis, right? You got your PhD at yeah, Davis. Yeah, I went to uh, University of California, Davis. There's a, there's a backstory to this that I have to share to be uh, authentic. Mm-hmm. I was in the uh, graduate uh, program and they um, accepted me for a PhD. And I had uh, completed my master's degree, which I did at Fossil Falls and had a a master's uh, paper for my cultural resource management plan. And I alluded to that in the first one. Well, then I did my orals and my writtens and my language exams and passed them. But then I had a, um, uh, an interesting experience where my major professor decided to pass away. Oh, and, and, and I had to, in turn, uh, do something about that and re- recompose my committee. So. I did that and put the committee back together as best I could, but I found that one of the individuals who um, was chairing the committee did not approve of the subject matter of my PhD. He wanted it to be changed, Mm -hmm. and that was after completing all of the uh, field work, and so I um, was in a bit of a pickle and decided at that point to uh, see if I could leverage that association and find some way to change his mind, which I couldn't. And so I uh, literally walked away from the uh, university and uh, the archaeology profession. I had a, a period where I wasn't doing archaeology and uh, left for uh, hmm. quite, a, quite, a, quite a bit of time, actually. It was a, about a decade, a decade and a half before I returned to uh, finish up my PhD dissertation. Okay. And so, and so when I did that, it was a challenge because uh, everyone I knew from before had passed away. <laughs> all the, all the professors had gone and the, um, I tried to uh, reenter the uh, university. And fortunately the uh, graduate department was very flexible. And uh, when I tried to reenter the anthropology department, they, really didn't want that. So I had to go to the graduate division and they said, you know, Alan, we've had problems with an anthropology department before and you're not the first that's uh, come here. You're not the first one on the rodeo. So mm-hmm. you can get, you can get what's called an individual PhD. I said, what the heck is that? They said, well, you have to get uh, two professors who are part of the uh, camp- campus at UC Davis. You can have an outside individual and then uh, we will waive all requirements and uh, you can have an individual PhD. And so that's what I did. I brought, I brought in Michael Morato, who's one of the most prestigious and influential archaeologists in California. In essence, he wrote the book on California archaeology. And he was uh, the chair of my committee. And then I had someone who was a cultural geographer and another one who was a, uh, a botanist and human ecologist as well. And uh, those were the three individuals. So it took me two years to put the committee together and another, I'd say another two or three years to rewrite my entire dissertation, bringing it fast forward uh, a decade. And I changed it radically in terms of the um, conclusion and synthesized and added all the new information that was available over that time. I ultimately got the uh, PhD and it was, let's say, uh, I'd say it was 28 years after the fact. I had a draft of the PhD (laughs) approved by my major professor and 28 years to the fact is when I walked and got my, my uh, sheepskin, my, my degree. And I was, I was (laughs) one of, I was one of the oldest uh, PhD recipients of any at uh, UC Davis. So that, nice, that, in its, nice. that in itself was a very interesting uh, journey. But uh, the reason I say that is to uh, broadcast to others, it doesn't matter how difficult it is. It doesn't matter how many problems you have. If you want to do something bad enough and hard enough and focused, when you have uh, adversaries, the answer to that is you can outlive them. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Just, Absolutely. Yeah, just j- just stay after it and eventually if you stay at bat you can uh, win the game. So 
I, I used the same subject matter as I had planned for my draft PhD dissertation. What I had done was I used the archaeological studies, the investigations of about, uh, let's say, 50 different archaeological sites that were all mm-hmm. located along what they call the Pacific Crest Trail, which is there in the High Sierra. Along that trail, there are a variety of archaeological sites that are associated with the upland, both uh, pinon exploitation, meaning the, the pinon nut harvests, and there are village sites, and there's rock guard sites, and other things along those lines. The theoretical mm-hmm. orientation I had was to try to understand what they call the numic spread. <laughs> the num- mm-hmm. the, and so uh, the numic when I, spread. Yeah. The numic spread. And, and, I, and the joke goes if you want the numic spread, it's pinion nut butter. <laughs> I think that's I had that on numic- my toast this morning. That's right. Pinion nut butter. So <laughs> numic or numic, either way, are the. Uh, the native people who speak a language throughout the entire Great Basin of either Paiute or Shoshone. And this is a branch of what's called one of the largest uh, linguistic stocks throughout North America, throughout the Americas. It's called Uto Aztecan. And so the Uto Aztecan mm-hmm. expression, this branch, this linguistic group, this group of native people, they were Paiutes and Shoshones. According to the linguistic data and many archaeologists, they believe that they developed uh, very high population densities in eastern California, probably in the Owens Valley. And only about a thousand years ago or less, they moved out from eastern California or the southwestern corner of the Great Basin and expanded over the entire Great Basin. So if you can imagine Mm -hmm. foragers, hunter-gatherers expanding through that entire area and... uh, beginning to emigrate and replace what they call the pre numic people. So anyways, okay. we looked at it archaeologically, and I found uh, signatures both of cultural material, archaeological material, and rock art materials that were associated with various linguistic groups. We tested those sites and dated them using obsidian hydration dating, which we'll talk about sometime and then also radiocarbon dating. And what I found was, is the Indians that lived up in the South Fork of the Kern River in the high elevations of the Kern Plateau, the South Fork of the Kern River, that group's called the Tabatalabal. Tabatalabal, say it fast six times, (laughs) Tabatalabal. (laughs) Tabatalabal. Yeah, Tabatalabal. Tubat means pinion pine nut and labal means to eat. And so my, um, my joke that goes along with that is if you go to the University of California, at Berkeley and you go through their museum and you talk to the basketry specialist, he says, I have a California Indian joke, Alan. He says, well, tell it to me. It's a material culture. You see this basket here that has pinion pitch around the outside? I says, yes. What is that? He says, I don't know. It looks like it's a, you know, a jug. So that's a Tabata Lava mm-hmm. water bottle. <laughs> it's a, it's a tab- <laughs> say it fast six times, Tabata Lava water bottle. And that's what that was. Nice. So the Tabata, so the Tabata Lava were up there in the high elevations. And they're what they call a linguistic isolate of Uto Aztecan. They're not numic. Mm-hmm. They're probably Tokic or a linguistic isolate. And the archaeological evidence that I put together shows that they moved in as early as 500 BC and continuously occupied the area with, that, with uh, sort of autochthonous or independent, an isolated expression. And so uh, they were there. Yet the people that lived adjacent to them, right there next to them in the crest, next to the crest of the Sierras and the Western Great Basin in the Mojave Desert, were relatively recent intruders into that area. Their occupation hmm. was only, I would say, a thousand or fifteen hundred years of continuous occupation, and they moved in relatively late. They had a desert adaptation, the other California, much more California orientation. What does it have to do with rock art? When you see pictures of their rock paintings on the crest of the Sierras, in the area where the Numic people, they were called Kawaiasu, Panam and Shoshone, Owens Valley Paiute, 
They have paintings yeah. that have pictures of bighorn sheep on them. The mm-hmm. other Indians that are literally right there, a stone's throw away, don't ever have any pictures of bighorn sheep. They don't eat bighorn sheep. They don't hunt bighorn sheep. And they have a different signature with respect to their archaeological record. Fascinating. Really amazing that you can match archaeology with language and with ethnicity and then take it back and look at the chronological element, the time depth of those people. Yeah, looking at multiple data sources and finding where they cross, I mean, that really is the secret sauce here. That's what helps us really identify that we're on the right path. Um, I love it when that happens, too. Uh, Is there any evidence that those two groups mixed or at least talked to each other or shared any sort of ideas or any or cultural transmission of any sort of any nature whatsoever later on in, uh, you know, pre-European history? Yes, yes, there, there was. There was a you know, considerable interaction between what they would call the Tabatalabal, the South Fork Kern River Indians, and those that lived mm-hmm. in Tehachapis and lived in the Western Mojave Desert. As historic times continued in about 1850, the Tabatalabal allowed their neighbors, who were the desert dwellers, the Numic people, the Kawaiasu and Panamit Shoshone, to establish a village site on the very margins of their territory. And so historically, we know that that there was one there. What's very, very interesting about this is that they were foes. They were enemies of one another. The um, Tabatalabal, the South Fork Kern River Indians, went in there very early, and they established themselves in an area that had a permanent river, both California and Great Basin resources, including fish and pinion and acorns and other uh, they had other animals that they could hunt, both deer and a variety of other smaller game. And the margin, more marginal Indians did not have those kinds of resources accessible to them. So at times they had uh, skirmishes, minor warfare, and uh, unfortunately people were, were killed and they defended their territory to the death. Hmm. Wow. That's amazing. It's really interesting to me how we can we can see this in and again multiple lines of evidence uh, that this is all pulling together. So that's a good point actually to stop this segment and to pick this up on the other side. We'll be back in a minute. Chris Webster here for the Archaeology Podcast Network. We strive for high quality interviews and content so you can find information on any topic in archaeology from around the world. One way we do that is by recording interviews with our hosts and guests located in many parts of the world all at once. We do that through the use of Zencaster. That's Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R. Zencaster allows us to record high-quality audio with no stress on the guest. Just send them a link to click on, and that's it. Zencaster does the rest. They even do automatic transcriptions. Check out the link in the show notes for 30% off your first three months, or go to Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R dot com and use the code ROCKART. Looking to expand your knowledge of x-rays and imaging in the archaeology field? Then check out An Introduction to Paleo Radiography, a short online course offering professional training for archaeologists and affiliated disciplines. Created by archaeologist, radiographer, and lecturer James Elliott, the content of this course is based upon his research and teaching experience in higher education. It is approved by the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists as four hours of training. That's in the UK, for those of you that don't know. So don't miss out on this exciting opportunity for professional and personal development. For more information on price and course structure, visit paleoimaging.com. That's P-A-L-E-O imaging.com. And look for the link in the show notes to this episode. Welcome back to the Rock Art Podcast with myself and Dr. Alan Garfinkel. Is that what we're saying today? That's the, that's <laughs> the one. <laughs> so let's let's take this in a little different direction because we got a lot of stuff we want to talk about here. So one of the things we discussed in the setup for this show was archaeoastronomy. And I'll tell you what, if I had it to do all over again, I think, and like you said in the beginning, you know, it's never too late, but I, I think archaeoastronomy would, would be a direction I want to go because um, I'm not... I don't know. I'm really I've always been very interested in astronomy and physics and space, and I'm very interested in how uh, ancient people without it's not to say that they didn't have any knowledge. Obviously, they had very high knowledge of everything in their environment. 
but they had different ways of interacting with the night sky and not just the night sky, but other things we could see like stars going supernova. We have depictions of those across the world. The supernova pictograph, which I've seen down at Chaco Canyon is, is fantastic. And, uh, and that particular one was illustrated in other places. So the way that people interacted in different societies with the, the heavens for lack of a better term and how they illustrated that in rock art has always been fascinating to me. And I think I wish I could have studied that more. So why don't we talk a little bit about archaeoastronomy and we'll start with how, how you define archaeoastronomy and how it's intersected with your life. Well, you know, it's interesting. I've, um, I've known about the field of archaeoastronomy for much of my adult life. And in California, we were, we have a whole plethora of people that, uh, came on board early on. And one of my closest friends and colleagues, uh, Robert Schiffman, was one of the pioneers, one of the first people to, to uh, recognize the value of archaeoastronomy. And the other gentleman that's been part and parcel of the same flavor is Ed Krupp. And he is the director of the Griffith Park Observatory here in Los Angeles. So really the study of archaeoastronomy relates to understanding the cosmology, the worldview of a native people and how they related to the heavens. Sometimes those Mm -hmm. celestial bodies, the sun, the moon, could in fact be deities or gods or goddesses to them. And in, in essence, then they incorporate that in their rock art, but also they have people that are responsible, typically shamans, medicine persons, medicine men, medicine women, that are sun watchers. And it is their job to identify certain key dates for the movement of the stars and the sun and the moon in the sky. So as an example, there's a rather famous, one of the first sites ever discovered in California that has archaeoastronomical significance is within the Tabatalabal country in the Kern River, the South Fork of the Kern. It's there on Canebrake Flat. And on that flat, if you uh, drive along Highway 178 and you either turn right or left, depending on the way you're going, you go down Chimney Creek Road as though you're going to go up the back route up to the top of the Kern Plateau, you'll see off to your left a massive boulder, a singular boulder that's split in half and it's hanging off the side of the slope above a rather steep drainage. Well, if you hike Mm -hmm. a tiny bit down that, across that flat, down that drainage and up that that arroyo, you'll get to this enormous boulder. And on that boulder, they have a a series of marks in red, a tally mark, and they also have other figures, anthropomorphic figures, that look like uh, men and women, and they're arrayed on this boulder. Well, one of the things that occurs on that boulder is a line that runs from the top of the boulder all the way down to the bottom of the boulder in red. And next to that line is a depiction of the sun coming up behind the highest peak in the far Southern Sierra, which is Owens Peak. Hmm. And you see the rays of the sun coming up there in the back of that image. So actually Bob Schiffman early on wanted to test whether that had any sort of archaeoastronomical associations. And lo and behold, he he did discover that both the winter solstice sunrise and the summer solstice sunrise was in fact depicted on that painting. Well, fast forward about maybe 20, 30 years later, And I had never been there to experience that phenomenon. So I talked to the native people and they said, you know, we've never been there either. And no one in fact really knows much about that experience. So I took my friends, the Tabatalaba, the South Fork of the Kern River Indians, and we went out there early on and froze our butts off. We were there, you know, December 21st at winter solstice. Which is quite a, you know, we're there at the, uh, you know, near the crest of the Sierras <laughs> and sitting yeah. there, sitting there waiting for the sun to come up. We got there early at 630, nothing. 
7 o'clock, nothing. Finally, about 7.30, the sun decides to wake up and show its wonderful face. And you see the light <laughs> coming up first, and it, it, it lightens and showers the entire hillside. And then this glowing orb, this unbelievable uh, pulsating orb, slowly comes over the very peak at the very top and shows itself and sits there for several, I would say it looks like 5, 10, 15 seconds, just sits there on top of that peak and then moves towards the heavens. And that was the most mm. ethereal, you know, virtual religious experience. And my relationship to the sun has never been the same. The Indians were singing. They were, uh, they were singing songs and they were using uh, clap, clapper sticks. And they used a native name to uh, call it the House of the Sun and named it in their language. Very wow. exciting. Very exciting. Very wonderful yeah. to experience something like that. That's amazing. And I, I love the alignments that really, that really puts you in direct connection with people at any point in the past when they have these like solstice alignments or, um, you know, usually it is a solstice because that's, that's the one that they can predict the most, you know, whether it's winter or summer solstice, they know that, Hey, this, this short time frame here, usually it's actually a couple days, not just one day technically, but, uh, for a couple days, the sun we know is going to be right here. Uh, it's going to rise here. It's going to set here, you know, this location on the planet. And one of the cool things about that, just as I'm mentioning this, in case anybody hears this before, before June of 2020, is I just heard that one of the most world famous, I guess, structures, for lack of a better way to say that, uh, is Stonehenge uh, related to archaeoastronomy, you know, because Stonehenge has some very particular alignments. And I know that's not over here in the United States, but still, uh, one of the cool things they're doing for the first time ever ever is they're streaming the solstice from so it's Stonehenge so people can see it because a lot of people usually congregate there, but I don't think they're allowing that or they're not planning to be able to allow that because of the the, the quarantine and mass gathering situations that have all been shut down. So that's kind of cool. And it would be really neat for other people to experience that in other places because I know there's some places in Chaco Canyon, like you've mentioned, there's places all over the world where there's alignments like that that happen. And it's just really amazing. I love it. So the the thing that I didn't understand being a, you know, born in the Bronx, New York, and living in a metropolitan city for my whole life was mm -hmm. the sun moves across the heavens and it stops in its tracks at the winter solstice and at the summer solstice. And so what you're seeing is the end game of the sun. And so in turn, it turns around and follows the path back in the other direction. So the winter solstice mm -hmm. and the winter solstice sunrise cross-culturally is a, a magnificent and very, very important event for speakers of this Uto-Aztecan language. For instance, in Mesoamerica or in the, amongst the Hopi or amongst the Aztec and the Maya and the Huichol, that is a very important ceremony. It's called the new fire ceremony. And it's when they kindle the fires and reignite the year and influence the engine of the cosmos and the universe to continue its travels and move back again, following its path and reignite this circuitous timeline that continues for infinity. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, so it really is awesome. Yeah, you want to know another site that we saw that's archaeoastronomy, number two? Yeah, absolutely. Eastern yeah. Mojave Desert, Mary's Cave. We have, Fortunately, we have a contract. Far Western Anthropological Research Group has a contract to study one of the most unique sites that exists in the entire California desert. It's called Mary's Cave. Okay, so Chris, you can ask me, why is mm -hmm. it called Mary's Cave? <laughs> Why is it called Mary's Cave? <laughs> because Mary, in 1910, with her husband, was traveling by there, and she decided to give birth at that time, and they pulled off and in a rock shelter. Her husband, Mr. Woods, birthed the baby right there at the foot of the shelter. Hmm. <laughs> so nice. that's, that's nice. Mary's. That's why it's Mary's Cave, also called Mary's Bedroom. So... This, this site is unusual. First of all, 
It's a small rock shelter. And on the floor of the rock shelter, there's about 50 to 100 cupules. Cupules are small little dents in the rock, little concave pits that the native people pecked into the rock. So, of course, the question is going to be, why why did they do that, Alan? (laughs) You know, what's what's wrong with them? Why did they make these pits in the... uh, Right. On, on the rocks. Well, so the cross-culturally, when we've studied cupules for indigenous people, one of the most prominent reasons they do that is for fertility. If you wanted to ensure a healthy child, or if you're having difficulty having a child, you would take a, take a, a rock and pound it against another rock and create rock flower. That rock flower would then be rubbed on your body. And this would be a prayer, a means of then ensuring that the tribe and the individual and the family and the person who's going through the ceremony has a healthy child and is able to procreate and have children. So okay. it has so it has a fertility side, a reproductive symbolism. So that's on the bottom of the site in the rock shelter. But even more okay. magnif- magnificently, on the ceiling of the rock shelter and in the back of the rock shelter is a cacophony, just a covered, uh, uh, you know, a mural of every color, blue, red, white, of images that are celestial. It shows the sun and sunbursts flying through the sky. It's got... Uh, mountains, it's got starbursts, and it's all over the entire ceiling and the back the back panel of this rock shelter. Also, yes. also they have naturally occurring portals in the ceiling, holes that exist. This is a volcanic breccia. And around those holes, they added little starbursts, little, little lines to show the bursting of the the actual imagery. And in some of those holes, they're glistening because they would put their fingers through those holes, probably vis-a-vis the ceremony. So Mm -hmm. all all of that is interesting, but that's not, I haven't even begun to sell yet or tell you the story because, (laughs) because if you look out from that rock shelter to the horizon, you see a spot on the horizon where a hill meets a very flat panel of of mountains. And on summer solstice sunrise, the sun peeks out and peers out specifically right in that little groove, that little channel, that little V-shaped corridor exactly there. That was originally identified by uh, John Rafter back in the 1980s. Fast forward, a professional astronomer spent 20 years studying that site and another related site to prove and support that this exactly occurs and is scientifically replicable and has validity. He was even able to say during what period of time most likely that particular observation was done. It was about AD 1000, so about 1000 years ago. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Let's let's just keep talking about archaeoastronomy in the last few minutes of this segment. What sure. other depictions that that maybe people can see even when they're you know out of rock art sites, uh, if they're if they're at some you know some parks or whatever? I know there's a few that you can just visit right off the highway here in Nevada. But if they're at rock art sites, what are some things that they can look at? Some things that they can look for that may be related to astronomy because we're. We're probably going to talk about this extensively throughout the course of this podcast, but a lot of rock art is is very difficult to interpret uh, because some of it's abstract lines and things like that. But do you know of anything that is like definitively related to astronomy or the heavens, or or is that even possible? You know, things that we can see. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that as an example, one of my most recent pieces of research is uh, there's a public canyon that people are allowed to go visit. And it's in the Coso Range of Eastern California, near Ridgecrest, Inyo Kern, and Mojave. And when they go down that canyon, 
the entire canyon is, is littered with depictions of moon, sun, stars, and there's a specific panel that exists that I believe, and it's very persuasively identified, that is a creation narrative, a sacred narrative. And that sacred narrative, that creation story, is an ancient Udo Aztecan story that relates both to the Huichol, the Nahua or Aztec, and even the Hopi. All of those cultures mm-hmm. have a similar uh, repertoire or, or sacred narrative that during ancient times, that there was a moon goddess or earth mother, and the, there was no stars in the sky, and five pilgrims went along to create the sun. And this is, and this, hmm. all, all of this is arrayed on a particular boulder, uh, very specifically. I could get into that a little deeper. Yeah. Well, let's possibly do that on the other side of the break, and we will come back and continue talking about this back in a minute. You may have heard my pitch for membership. It's a great idea and really helps out. However, you can also support us by picking up a fun t-shirt, sticker, or something from a large selection of items from our tea Public store. Head over to arcpodnet.com slash shop for a link. That's arcpodnet.com slash shop to pick up some fun swag and support the show. America, we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. By honoring your sacred vocation of nursing, you impact your family, your friends, and your community. At Grand Canyon University, our online RN to BSN, MSN, or DNP degree programs allow you to balance online coursework with local in-person clinical, practicum, or immersion hours. Find your purpose at GCU. Private, Christian, affordable. Visit gcu.edu. Welcome back to the Rock Art Podcast, episode two. And so we're wrapping up this discussion, but I I wanted to clarify in the last segment, you brought up this sacred site that you discovered. Tell me a little bit more about this. I mean, let's just get into this thing because there's a lot more wrapped up in this that we could discuss. And I want to detail that a little bit. So let's talk about it. So this is a very long winded story, but there is a brand new book that came out that is sort of cutting edge rock art study, both theory and practice. It was done by Carolyn Boyd. And she talked about the um, Pecos, South Texas site, White Shaman Mural. And I wanted to read that book because I knew it was very important. It won the National Award from the Society for American Archaeology for the best new book. So I tried to read it and I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> it was overwhelming. <laughs> Absolutely beyond my comprehension. A lot of it was based on Mesoamerican studies. I'd say two-thirds of the, maybe a third to two-thirds were original reports and books that were done only in Spanish. And so you really had to have a deep knowledge of the Mesoamerican cosmology and the history and, and just an understanding of what she was getting at. But I, I stayed at it. I, I don't uh, let any grass grow under my heels. I mm-hmm. consistently just probe and posture. It took me two years to get through the book. The way I did it, I ate the elephant in small bites. I took it word by word in the index and <laughs> read, read only the section on each word and said, if I can figure this out, you know, I'll go from dot to dot. So I finally figured it all out. And uh, about that same time, independent of that serendipitous experience, I said, you know, I've been working in this area called the Coso region. It's where my, partly my PhD research was done, but also it's been one of my grand obsessions for about 40 years. And I said, you know, I've seen a number of places in the Kosos, but I've never gone to their archive. So let me go to the archive and let me talk to the director. And I bet they have a lot of different digital images of rock art that I could download and maybe I'll find some new things. So they let me in. They spent the whole day. I went through hundreds, if not thousands of images. I found a great number of them that were quite enticing and interesting. And I thought I could understand something about them or they said something to me. And so Mm -hmm. I, uh, I grabbed maybe only a dozen or two dozen at most. And so as I was going down this Canyon, that's publicly available I found this pyramidal boulder 
And this pyramidal boulder had five figures on it around the outside, a single figure in the center of it. That single figure in the center, they were all solid body. They didn't have decorations in their bodies. Appeared to be holding two snakes, a snake in each hand. Mm. And then the five figures around the outside had their hands up in the air and looked like they were holding parachutes. <laughs> and I said, and I said, what the hell is that? I've never seen that before. I've been in this Canyon yeah. dozens of times. So then I remembered this book that I just read and I says, you know, she was talking about five figures and that five is supposed to be this very important number for ancient Uto Aztecan people. And this five has to do with a symbol called the uh, Quin Sunk, Q-U-I-N-C-U-N-X. It's a symbol that means five. Why are they so obsessed with the number five? Well, the number five is an integrated synthesis. Okay. What I mean by that is you can, th you can think about a compass, north, south, east, and west. That's four. And if you take those four points and you interact them or culminate them or hyper-focus them, that's the central point and that's number five. So number five and an understanding of the fiveness of the universe was something that came along with ancient Uto Aztecan people, the Huichol, the Hopi, the Maya, the Aztec, what have you. Well, on this rock, there's five primordial pilgrims. They're right hmm. there. There's five figures. And in the center of this image, there's this pr person, this figure, holding snakes. Well, they go, what the hell is snakes doing with this person? And what does it have to do with the five? <laughs> so <laughs> then I remembered, oh, wait a second. There's two figures up at the crest of Coso Peak that I got this image from the archive. Mm-hmm. And one's a woman because you can tell she's a woman because they have explicit genitalia on this female. They're both holding snakes. There's an upper figure, a lower figure. We know it's a snake because it has a snaky tongue <laughs> and a snaky head. <laughs> and they're S-shaped, which is supposed to be very significant to be S-shaped. And they're holding snakes. And at least the bottom one is female. And I know how old they are. Because the, the, the artisan was very nice to me, and he put diagnostic, temporally diagnostic, chronologically sensitive, projectile points, dart points on their heads, and you could tell what they are. <laughs> nice. They are, nice. They, are El, they are Elko series projectile points, dart points. Elko series points mm -hmm. named for Elko, Nevada. They are the, the most recent dart point before they began just preceding the introduction of the bow and arrow. They go from about 2000 BC to about AD one, about the time of Christ. And they're uh, in the Southwestern corner of the great basin. They're very chronologically sensitive. So we go back there to look at this other image and it has snakes. They have snakes. Well, as it turns out, Carolyn Boyd in the Pecos has images of the five primordial pilgrims and what she calls the lunar goddess. Why is she a lunar mm. goddess? Well, she's like Coatlicue, which is this enormous statue in Mesoamerica in Mexico City that I saw. And it's called the woman of the snakes. She's got snakes all over her and she has a snake skirt. Okay. Why, sna why snakes? Snakes mean to Uto Aztecan people life. They're not bad, they're good. When you cut open a person and look at their insides, they have veins and arteries and entrails, and those all look like snakes. Also to Uto Aztecan hmm. people, a snake slithers, slithers along the ground, and that slithering motion mirrors the same kind of movement of water. So they say the snake is a water being. And the okay. snake... The snake symbol is a symbol of the earth. Why the earth? Well, snakes go in the ground, but they're on the surface of the ground. So they're a ground dweller. So the snakes are a female symbol. 
it's an earth symbol. It's a vitality symbol. It's a uh, renewal symbol, all those things. So what I'm looking at on that picture in the Koso range there is a parallel image of a sacred narrative of the creation of the sun. They had five primordial pilgrims. Five of these individuals who at the dawn of the time before time walked to walk towards Dawn Mountain, as it was called, to create the sun. And as the story goes, they needed light. So they took the lunar goddess, who's represented with this with the snakes, and she brought the light for them to follow them to Dawn Mountain. Hmm. One of those pilgrims had to sacrifice themselves, be thrown in the fire, so he could become the sun. So the biggest, tallest, most uh, interesting image on that rock is probably the sacrificial victim. Well, after they sacrificed, went down into the underworld and shot themselves up to create the sun, there was one problem. The sun wouldn't move. It needed more energy. It needed to be lifted up. So those five primordial pilgrims that are arrayed around the edge of that boulder are pushing up the sky. They're the sky Hmm. bearers pushing up those clouds. Those parachutes are the clouds. And the clouds are rain. And so this is something that is a story that's told by the Weechul, also by the Hopi, and also by the Aztecs, that are a very, very ancient story that probably has parallels to this boulder that actually exists 2,000 years ago. That boulder Hmm. is 2,000 years old. Jeez. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. (laughs) 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 I know. I drank the Kool-Aid, right? I I just, I I went off the deep, I went off the deep end. I'm sorry. (laughs) Well, there is so much I could follow up on with that. However, I'm sure we're going to talk about some of this stuff later on in future episodes and, and, and with some guests we're going to bring on. But in the last six or seven minutes of this show, I want to talk about the California Rock Art Foundation because we mentioned that you you know were instrumental in founding that. Um, but I want, to, I want to hear more about the story. So what, what led to the California Rock Art Foundation and, and how did that come about? So about six years ago, I decided after asking a number of people in California whether it would be a good idea to start an organization, I uh, knew that there was all these local avocational organizations throughout California, archaeological societies, avocational societies, et cetera. And a lot of those were identified that had a great interest in rock art, but there was no overarching integration. There was no connection that allowed those various entities to integrate and come together in some sort of a synthesis. And so I said, mm-hmm. well, I, th- I, th- I think it'd be a good idea to have an overarching organization. And I think we could be uh, a powerful advocate for conservation, for preservation, for documentation. And other states had such organizations. There's the Nevada Rock Art foundation. There's one in Texas called Shumla, but there was, was, there wasn't any in California. California has some of the richest Hmm. rock art entities in all the world. We have some of the most dramatic and elaborate paintings that exist anywhere. certainly in the, in the hemisphere, we have the greatest concentration of rock art in Eastern California. And we have a great, great diversity of imagery used from the 300,000 or more natives that we had in pre-European times that spoke 90 different languages. So hmm. I thought it would be a great idea to, to have such an entity. So, of course, since I'm independently wealthy, I decided to have a um, corporation <laughs> <laughs> and set sure, that up. Yeah ended up costing me $5,000 to put everything together, the, the corporate, the this, the that. And uh, mm-hmm. we, I began to assemble a board of directors and on and on. So it's been very, very, very slow in terms of getting any traction and making this happen. But we have uh, 
come somewhat far now. I, I feel that we've been around six years. We have uh, field trips. We have seminars. We have cultural tours. We're doing contract work and uh, contracted work for the National Park Service and the Bureau of Land Management. And we've, we've got a reputation and we have a bit of a following. So uh, I think we're blessed. You know, again, it's another example of blind pig finds acorn. If you just stay at, at bat long enough, you're going to hit a home run. So that's where we are with that. We've uh, got about okay. 15 board members. We have field trips. When there's field trips to be had, we uh, go to Tomokani in the Tachapi Mountains. We go to out in Visalia to a Rocky Hill. We go to um, also to the Kosos when it's open and available. Where else have we gone? We go to Baja. We've had a, a whole plethora, a whole inventory of cultural tours to the uh, largest prehistoric paintings in the world in the Sierra de San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And we just got back from one of those trips. It, in this area, on the peninsula of Mexico, there's an area called the Sierra de San Francisco. It's called the Grand Canyon of Mexico. And there are no roads. It's very poorly watered. It Does, doesn't get much rain. And no one lives there to speak of. And if you want to go see the paintings, you get on the back of a mule. <laughs> and, they, <laughs> and, and, and the mule goes on these trails that are animal trails. And the gear that you follow with is on burrows. So it's, it's, a, it's a grand adventure. And uh, these are available from uh, groups that have been doing this for many decades. And you could say it's safe, <laughs> but it, it, is a bit, it is a bit scary, I have to say, when you look down over the course of your, of your mula and uh, you're looking down several thousand feet into the uh, drainage below. <laughs> <laughs> so many, many stories that I could tell you about uh, jumping on the back of a mule. My first trip there, they asked me, they said, well, you know, of course, you're, you're a well-known researcher and you've done rock art studies for many years. I'm sure that you're, you're quite an accomplished equestrian. He says, you know, you must know something about <laughs> riding animals. And I said, well, yeah, the last time I rode an animal was probably a burrow at Knott's Berry Farms at the age of eight. <laughs> so they looked at me like I was nuts, but uh, I, I jumped on anyways on my mula, lived to tell the tale. I'd been back there several times. The uh, paintings are in rock shelters, and okay. these, are, these are images that are larger than life size of animals, principally deer, but also bighorn sheep, and also uh, figures I call them shamanistic ancestor deities. These are huge figures, larger than life size, one or two, probably two, twice, twice the size of an average human being. And they're done principally in red and black. And they're absolutely magnificent. You don't know what to look at. You, the, the countryside is gorgeous. The caves are tremendously adorned with these just otherworldly paintings. And it's uh, just an amazing, amazing adventure. Nice, nice. All right. Well, that is all the time we have for this time around. Uh, I'm sure we'll have more episodes where we talk about all of your stories, Alan. And uh, there isn't <laughs> enough. There aren't enough terabytes on the hard drive to actually fill all those podcasts. <laughs> well, I'm so glad you you're putting up with me, Chris Webster. We're, I'm having a blast. So uh, that's right. That's right. Ap appreciate you guys uh, patching in and listening, and hopefully you'll be learning something about the. Uh, wonderful field of archaeology, anthropology, and rock art, because uh, it's certainly been, as, as we said in the old days, an e-ticket ride, just like they had in Disneyland. That's right. So, all right. Well, thanks everybody for listening to this. Keep an eye out for new episodes coming out. Uh, subscribe to this feed. If you're listening to this on the Archaeology Podcast Network All Shows feed, which many of you probably are for the first time, feel free to go over and subscribe directly to this podcast. You can find the show notes and everything at arcpodnet.com 
forward slash rock art. And then you can find all the episodes over there. We also play on all the major podcast applications and we're on the brand new, as you probably heard an ad for in the show, uh, the brand new Lyceum app, which is spelled L Y C E U M. And it's an app just for educational podcasts. And they just started curating the archeology span podcast network back catalog and featuring us on their homepage just a few weeks ago as we're recording this on May 19th. So it's a brand new application, but it's a nice place to see other particular educationally focused podcasts. It's a nice place to see all that. So again, thanks everybody for listening and please like and subscribe and leave some comments and we will see you next time. And thank you, Alan. Take care. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Rock Art Podcast with Dr. Alan Garfinkel and Chris Webster. You can find this podcast on the educational podcast app Lyceum, L-Y-C-E-U-M, and wherever you find podcasts. Find show notes and contact information at www.arcpodnet.com forward slash rock art. Thanks for listening and thanks for sharing this podcast with your family and friends. This show is produced and recorded by the Archaeology Podcast Network, Chris Webster and Tristan Boyle, in Reno, Nevada, at the Reno Collective. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info.